Tesla's full self-driving 10.69.3 release notes are out, and from what I can see, it looks like a doozy. Let's take a look at the release notes and figure out what they're actually saying. Hey y'all, it's Dr. Know-It-All. I'm super happy to have a chance to look at these release notes for 10.69.3. Elon teased this was going to be a big update, and it is, although I think it might be missing one of the things that I was expecting, but it also might be there as well. It's a little hard to tell. We're gonna have to read between the lines a little. But anyway, without further ado, let's start because there's quite a few things we need to talk about here. First up, starting with the number one release note, upgraded the object detection network to photon count video streams and retrained all per parameters with the latest auto-labeled data sets with a special emphasis on low visibility scenarios. Improve the architecture for better accuracy and latency, higher recall of faraway vehicles, lower velocity error of crossing vehicles by 20%, and improved VRU, or vulnerable road user, precision by 20%. All right, so this is a lot to go through. Let's just start, first of all, object detection network. So that's our important thing. It doesn't say occupancy network, so I'm not sure it's that thing, but it seems like it should be the occupancy network. So I'm not absolutely positive it's the occupancy network. There may be a separate thing called object detection, which may actually be the semantic aspect. So the occupancy network basically just says, I want to know what's occupied in space so that I don't drive there. It could be that the object detection network is the semantic version of that, which is basically saying what is that thing right is that a car or a tree or a squirrel or a bird or a person etc cetera, etc cetera. so I'm not absolutely positive it's not specifically stated what this object detection thing is but my guess would be that that is the semantic aspect so again it's the thing that identifies what it is it doesn't just detect it but also identifies what it is I could be wrong and it could be the occupancy network itself but there's a bunch of stuff that talks about the occupancy network later on so I would guess this is the semantic aspect of things but any Anyway, what they've done is they've gone to a raw photon count video streams, right? So they're not doing any pre-processing. This is interesting because I thought that they had already done this, but maybe they had done it for other aspects of the network. Remember that this full self-driving thing is not one neural network that's doing it. It's many, many, many neural networks. So this particular one might not have been using pure photon count video streams before. But anyway, the number one improvement you get is that you don't have as much latency because you're not doing pre-processing of the video stream before you're ingesting it into the neural network. And the second thing, which is very important, and as you're gonna see in just a second, it deals much better with dark or low light sort of situations. It can pull in the raw photons rather than the processed images, so you get to see things a lot more clearly than you would if it was a processed video image, something that looked good to human eyes. Anyway, they say that they retrained this, and it looks like the entire network, this part of the network, they retrained this from scratch on the latest auto-labeled data sets, which is really, really critical because their data sets keep improving and improving as they work on this auto-labeling aspect of their architecture. And then they also say they have special emphasis on low visibility scenarios. So that could be dark. It could also be foggy. It could be rainy. It could even be something like the sun shining directly into the camera or something like that. But anyway, I think it's probably low light, fog, rain, etc., things like that. But it's taking scenarios where it's very difficult to see and a human driver might not even be able to see anything. But anyway, they're training on this so it's able to pull out more data, which again obviates the need for radar, for LIDAR, for things like that. If you have these camera systems able to work with very, very low light through things like rain, through things like fog, through things like snow, potentially with sun in the eyes, things like that. So anyway, it makes these systems perform as well as systems with LIDAR or radar without needing that. So you don't have the sensor fusion issues and the expenses and the maintenance and the calibration that come with all of that other stuff. Then of course, the out outcome of all of this is it improves the architecture for better accuracy and latency, which means reduced time to do this, and a higher recall of faraway vehicles. And if we take a look at this, we have our old friend precision and recall. So false negatives at the bottom of recall, in order to have good recall, you want to get rid of false negatives. That's things that you don't see. So in the case of low light scenarios and things like that, the recall is critically important. You want to be able to see everything. It's very important to have a recall that's as near to 1.0 as possible. So if you imagine the true positives and then divided by true positives and you had zero false negatives, you would get a recall of 1.0, which is the best possibility. So the closer you can get to 1.0 with that, the better off you are. 
So anyway, in this situation, getting a higher recall of faraway vehicles is critical. And faraway vehicles are really, really important because that's what keeps the car from having to do these rapid decelerations and things like that. The further away it can see something and understand what it is, the better. And that's really great, especially in low light scenarios and things. You can also see there's a 20% lower velocity error of crossing vehicles. So again, in low light situations, in particular as a car is going across the scene in front of you, it's doing a better job of predicting exactly how fast it's going and whether you need to stop or take evasive maneuvers or something like that. And finally, improved vulnerable road user precision by 20%. And again, if we look at this, precision is false positives. So it's reducing the number of false pedestrians or cyclists or things like that that it's seeing. So those weird phantom braking things that you get sometimes if you drive full self-driving, that would be because of false positives for something like that. So reducing the false positives is really, really important for the comfort of the driver. Doesn't really matter for the safety of the vulnerable road users because for that you would want to improve the recall, but we've already got very good recall in the previous ones that we've seen. So it looks like what we've got here is too many false positives often. And by reducing that number, you don't have the car like suddenly stopping or something like that. And we're going to talk about pedestrians more in just a moment. The next two release notes items have to do with two stage networks. And we're going to talk about that more in just a second. Anyway, converted the VRU or vulnerable road user velocity network to a two stage network, which reduced latency and improved crossing pedestrian velocity error by 6%. So what is a two stage network? That is not being said by Tesla here. I'm going to take a guess at what that is. This is a complete speculative guess. I could very well be wrong about this. But what I'm going to guess is that maybe they have something like the occupancy network and then they have the object detection or semantic aspect of the network. And they used to just sort of all be bunched together and run at the same time. But now what they're doing is they're doing an occupancy network first pass. And so they're looking at the scene entirely. And then what they can do is in the second stage, they can kind of semantically segment out interesting items. So they don't have to semantically segment out things that are unimportant to the car. It can first go like this stuff is important. Now let me try to figure this out. That that would be my guess as to what the two-stage network is. Again, I could be totally wrong. But anyway, what that would do is that would reduce latency because you're not having to do all the semantic work on elements of the scene that are unimportant. You can just focus on the parts that are important so it can go faster. But anyway, no matter what this two-stage network is, you can see that they've reduced latency, which means it goes faster, and they've improved the crossing pedestrian velocity error by 6%. So not massive, but that does matter somewhat, right? Because if you're looking at a person going across the crosswalk or something, when the car needs to stop, when it can start back up again, how fast it can go, all of those things can be improved by those tiny little adjustments. So it's not sitting there waiting too long and you as the driver are like, come on, come on, come on, go, you know, because the guy's already out of the road or something like that. Or if the person's into the road, you need to stop a little bit sooner. So 6% could actually be quite a bit and the reduced latency is very, very important. Next, we've got converted the non-VRU attributes network. So in other words, not cyclists or pedestrians, etc., to a two-stage network, which reduced latency latency, reduced incorrect lane assignment of crossing vehicles by 45% and reduced incorrect park predictions by 15%. So again, here we've got a two-stage network. I would hazard a guess that the two-stage network is the same two-stage network as the previous one, but it might not be. But the upshot of all of this, again, is you reduce latency because you don't have to spend as much time processing. So every time you're reducing latency, you're making this thing react faster and more human-like. So reduce latency is super, super important. Anyway, then you've also got reduced incorrect lane assignment of crossing vehicles. So that's also important. So as a car is going across, what lane is it in? Like, is it in the closest lane to you, the next one over, the next one over, things like that. So the better it can predict those lanes, the better it can understand where it can go and how it can weave through traffic. And then also it reduced the incorrect parking predictions by 15%. So they actually talked about this at AI Day that there would be cars sometimes that are kind of awkwardly into the road. And it looks like the car might actually be occupied and being driven, but it's actually just parked there, but it's at a weird angle, so it looks like it's kind of going into the road or something. Anyway, if they can reduce that incorrect park prediction so they can make it better, the car isn't going to slow down falsely for a car that's actually parked, even though it might look like it's actually in the road and 
getting ready to take off and you know go into traffic or something. So that reduction also will be good for the occupants of the vehicle because you won't get false slowdowns when you don't need it. This next note has to do with John Emmons talk at AI Day and definitely check that out up here if you haven't seen it yet. It's a really, really good talk. Very important, very dear to my heart. Anyway, they reformulated the auto regressive vector lanes grammar to improve precision of lanes by 9.2%, recall of lanes by 18.7% and recall of forks by 51 0.1%, holy crap, includes a full network update where all components were retrained with 3.8x the amount of data. So first of all, what is vector lanes grammar? That is what John talked about in his talk. Basically, they're turning this 3D scene into a language and they're making lanes and how the lanes flow and the beginning and end and forking and all of that kind of stuff. They're turning that into a linguistic thing so that they can then use deep neural network models that are trained for languages and are appropriate for languages to actually be utilized in the scene in a 3D sense. So what you get out of that using our handy dandy cheat sheet again is that you get improved precision of lanes by 9.2%. In other words, it gets rid of false positives, which would be extra lanes that don't actually exist. So it's doing a better job of understanding what lanes are and not producing extra false positives. It's also increasing the recall of lanes by 18.7%, which means less false negatives, which is actually, again, probably more important. So that would be a thing where there are like a lane and a lane, and it's not seeing this extra lane. It's actually rather important that it sees that so improving that by 18.7 percent is fantastic and then recall of forks that would again be false negative so you don't want to come up on a road that splits like this that forks and not recognize it and so a 51 percent increase in the recall of forks is fantastic that means that it's seeing these things much much more cleanly and hopefully earlier than it has in the past and it's able to go like that's a fork in the road and it's able to be much better about seeing those and not missing those things so that you you end up in a situation where the car has to make a last minute decision or alter its course or something like that very rapidly. So this should result in much more smooth driving when you get to things like forks in the road. And then finally in this note, we see full network update. And if you go back to AI day, they actually talk about it taking like up to 30 days to do a full network update. So this is really absolutely insane. So they committed some serious compute power to this and they used 3.8 times the amount of data that they had. So they put a lot of compute time into this vector lanes grammar. And by the way, auto regressive just means what you do is you actually give it a scene that has everything in it and you remove pieces of it and have the neural network fill in the blanks. So the neural network is basically able to figure things out on its own. But anyway, by using 3.8 times the data, it should be much, much better at this lane grammar thing. So it should be much better about understanding what an intersection is, how the lanes flow between the intersection parts as you're making turns and going through the middle of the intersection section, all of that kind of stuff, forks in the road, et cetera, et cetera. So this again should make the car behave much, much better in complex intersections and complex scenarios like that. And then continuing on with the vector lanes neural network, we've got added a new road markings module to the vector lanes neural network, which improves lane topology error at intersections by 38.9%. So I assume this is a new module that's specifically designed to look at the roads themselves and see maybe those dashed lines that show you kind of where you're supposed to go or maybe some arrows or other things that are in the middle of intersections that oftentimes, honestly, are just a little bit confusing to me. But hopefully what it's doing is it's utilizing that and understanding these intersections better by using the road markings that are in the middle of intersections to help it understand how to get through an intersection and how to plot a path through it. And as they say, the lane topology, in other words, the way that these lanes go through these intersections was improved by 39%, basically. All right, moving on. And by the way, a big thank you to Holmar's Cat Catalog. He was the one who posted this also. Thank you so much, Omar. Sorry, meant to say that at the beginning, but I'll say it now. But anyway, I really do appreciate it. Thank you so much for posting this earlier today. All right, next up, we've got upgraded the occupancy network to align with road surface instead of ego, which is the car, for improved detection stability and improved recall at Hillcrest. So this note I found fascinating. What that means is that the occupancy network in the past was attached to the car. So like if you imagine something that's on the car that's driving with it as it's moving, and what they've done is they've shifted the 
occupancy network to match up with the road surface instead. So as they're projecting out this 3D world around the car, they're planting it onto the road rather than on the car. And what that's going to do is make everything much more stable. It's not gonna like jitter around like this every time the car bounces or you know turns a little bit or something like that. So this should actually improve things a great deal and make the whole occupancy network much more stable over time, especially things like you know no false negatives at the top of hill crests. So again, you want to be able to see the road, you wanna be able to project the road, you wanna be able to project occupancy without missing details. That's again, what recall is all about and especially as you go over hill crests you know you need to be able to keep that occupancy network occupied <laughs> as you go over this you don't want it suddenly like kind of like separating out from the road so that as you go over the hill crest you don't miss things you don't suddenly have like a person that's standing there suddenly separate and go up in the air according to what the car is and then the car doesn't think it's something that needs to worry about and then it's like oh crap I really do need to worry about that right so again this should actually help a huge amount it's a really really cool thing that they're doing. I can't imagine it was super easy to do that, to attach it to the road instead of the car, but it's really cool that they were able to do that. And that should again have a really big effect on the confidence of the vehicle as it's driving. Next up, we have reduced runtime of candidate trajectory generation by approximately 80% and improve smoothness by distilling an expensive trajectory optimization procedure into a lightweight planner neural network. So what is candidate trajectory generation? That would be if you are in a lane and there's another lane outside here and there's another car in front of you and some cars passing this direction, how are you going to get around that car, right? There's many, many different trajectories you could take. As a human being, of course, we're doing that in our brains. We're sort of thinking to ourselves, what's the best way to get around this car? How do I pass the car? How do I do all of these sorts of things? Well, what they're saying is that that trajectory generation for the ego car and potentially for the other cars as well, it doesn't really say it's only for the ego cars. So it could be trajectory generation for other cars in the scene also and figuring out where they might potentially go. So anyway, reducing the runtime, in other words, the amount of time it takes by 80% means that if it used to take 100 milliseconds to do all of these trajectory plans, and I, it had to be been less than that, but I'm just using that number because it's easy to divide out. Anyway, from 100 milliseconds, it now only takes 20 milliseconds to do this. So there, you know, again, they're eking out everything they can out of Hardware 3 and reducing this trajectory generation by 80% is a massive, massive improvement. So of course it's gonna to lead to improved smoothness because it's happening so much faster, it can make decisions more quickly. And the way they're doing this is they took an expensive trajectory optimization procedure I imagine it could have been something like A-star or something like that. So that's sort of a classic AI technique where you do sort of path planning. You look down different roads. It could be a depth first sort of thing. So it takes that one down a depth, then looks down this one, then down looks down this one, et cetera, et cetera. So that can take some serious time because you have to go through each of these things up to a certain point. It sounds like what they did was they essentially trained a neural network planner based on what they had with this. And then the neural network planner runs much, much faster. And it just learned from all the data how to do this. It's like, oh, this is likely the best path. And remember with neural networks, it's never about getting the absolute best result. It's about getting something that's pretty close to being the best result. That's perfectly fine. In a car driving situation, you don't have to have the 100% best trajectory. You just have to have something that's in the 90s. And it's gonna turn out to be very smooth. And the fact that it's faster means that it can do this. Many Many more times per second and so it, the whole driving experience will be much smoother and hopefully people around you will feel like your car is more confident as well. All right, the next note, I actually had to go look up and learn a new word. I did not know this word before. <laughs> Improved decision-making for short deadline lane changes around gores by richer modeling of the trade-off between going off route versus trajectory required to drive through the gore region. So I'm gonna look over here on Legal Beagle and it's basically highway entrance and exit ramps that they're talking about here. Um, that's my understanding. But essentially what it is, is as you merge into the highway or you exit off the highway, there's oftentimes sort of a triangular region that's marked off by white lines that you're not really supposed to go through, but you can, but that's marking that thing where the two lanes merge together. That part is called the gore, the area in between this. I don't know, it sounds kind of gory, like maybe accidents happen there, I don't know. But anyway. The idea here is that it's 
it, you're creating a flexible enough circumstance where the car could decide to drive through that gore to get onto the lane a little bit earlier if it looked like that was going to be a more optimal trajectory rather than waiting for that gore to completely end and for it to have very little time to merge into the lane. So, you know, the, the situation that you could imagine would be there's a lot of traffic, but there's like a little gap and you realize that you could scoot out if you scoot out a little bit early and you could get in. But if you wait until the merging, the gore actually ends, then you try to get in that car that was behind is going to catch up to you and you won't be able to merge. So there are places where you want to go through that sort of like no go area in order to merge more smoothly onto a highway. Same thing if you're exiting off the highway as well. So anyway, those situations are relatively rare, but it's really interesting that they're thinking about that. And there are situations where it's pretty crucial to be able to go through those gores in order to make a merge or to exit off of a freeway in an effective manner rather than being dangerous to yourself and the people around you. And again, note that they say short deadline lane changes. So we're talking about things where it's doing this and it's like, oh crap, got to go now. <laughs> you know, so it's that sort of thing. So what should happen is we should see this as we start driving 10.69.3 is we should see situations where we're like merging onto the highway and all of a sudden it just goes whoop and it just, you know, cuts across those white line areas and gets onto the highway or exits a little bit late and goes through. Those will be, it'll be exciting the first time it happens because I won't be expecting it, but then I'll remember it was in the release notes and go super cool that it's actually working that way. Next up is something that I, for one, will really appreciate driving through college campuses, and that is reduced false slowdowns for pedestrians near crosswalk by using a better model for the kinematics of the pedestrian. So this one's fairly readable. Essentially what it is is like, you know, how is the person walking across the road? Do they look like they're just about to enter the road at the crosswalk area, or do they look like they're talking to their friends and they're not actually intending to go across the road just yet? The better that the car can determine the intent of the pedestrian and their kinematics and how they're walking and all of that kind of stuff, the less false slowdowns you'll get in those areas where the car just comes to a stop for no reason and you have to press the accelerator to tell it to go ahead because that person wasn't actually really just about to cross the road. All right, and on to the last page. The next note is added control for more precise object geometry as detected by general occupancy network. So remember way back at the beginning of this video when I said that I was expecting the occupancy network to have more stuff discussed in it. This is the part where I think they might be sneaking something in, but I'm not positive about that. Anyway, the idea here is that we're looking at precise object geometry, in other words, smaller details of objects as detected by the general occupancy network. So in the past, as told me by engineers at Tesla themselves, they use a 30 centimeter by 30 centimeter by 30 centimeter cube. So it's pretty big. That's the occupancy thing. So like the size of my head ish, right? So that would be one voxel in this thing. And so my entire body would only be a relatively few voxels. That works fine for a lot of cases, but there are a lot of situations, particularly, <coughs> hint, hint, if you're not using ultrasonic sensors anymore and you're getting close to objects as you're parking, that you're going to want to have much, much more precise voxels in order to tell how far away you are from a curb or from other objects and things. So the interesting thing to me here is that it says that they've added a control. What does that mean? I assume that's not a user control where I'm sitting there spinning a knob and I can actually adjust something. I assume that that's a control that they have internally within this thing so that maybe when you're going very, very slowly, it turns down the voxel size because it knows that it's got more time to process this. So it can take the extra time and it can use that extra time to make these voxels significantly smaller so that when you're going in a parking lot or in a very slow velocity situation, you can turn the voxel size down and have much more precision. And then the faster you go, the bigger the voxels get. So that would be my guess. I had actually thought about this in a very different way, but this would be a very elegant solution to the problem as well. I was thinking about a thing where the voxels would be smaller close to the vehicle and then they would get bigger the further away you got. But instead of that, what this would be is the voxels would be smaller if you're going slowly and they would get bigger as you went faster. And that is really, really cool. So if you're driving at highway speeds like 70 miles an hour or 120 or 30 kilometers an hour, something like that, the voxels themselves would be fairly large because you're really only interested in kind of gross movement and things like that. So you would be able to see further because the voxels, the same number of voxels would project out much further into the distance. But when you're going really slowly, you don't really care about things that are super far away. You're just interested in things 
things that are close up, but you want to see those with a great deal of precision. So the occupancy network here, they could be telling us in a very, very subtle way that they've created a velocity based voxel size for the occupancy network. And if that's the case, that's really, really cool. Next up, we have one that I'm sure is going to be many people's favorite improvement. That is improved control for vehicles cutting out of our desired path by better modeling of their turning slash lateral maneuvers, thus avoiding unnatural slowdowns. So oftentimes it's very annoying because the car in front of you, you'll see. So you're behind the car like this and the car is moving over and getting out of your lane. And suddenly your car will like, er, and it'll stop as if it's like, oh no, I'm going to hit that car in front of me. And you're like, no, you won't because you can see that the car is moving out of the lane. So you as a human are like, yeah, yeah, they're out of the way. They're going to be gone by the time I get there, no big deal, but the car would do these unnatural slowdowns. So what they're telling us with this note is that they've modeled that better. And so it's going to do a better job of understanding this turning slash lateral movement. And we shouldn't get so many unnatural slowdowns in the future. We will have to wait and see when we actually get to drive 10.69.3. But when we do, I expect that that should go down and that would be really nice. Next up, we have improved longitudinal control while offsetting around static obstacles by searching over feasible vehicle motion profiles. So this is a situation where you're driving down a single lane road and there's a car parked in front of you. And the idea is, you know, you have to go out into the other lane to get around this car, something like that. So basically what they're doing is they're saying it's doing a better job of searching through the potential trajectories. And this goes back to that other note that we talked about previously, but it's doing a better job of figuring out which route to take. And I assume it's probably for the same reason that the earlier note was, and that is that it's able to more efficiently go through potential feedback feasible trajectories and figure out which one is the best one. So probably those two notes are actually related and I'm not actually positive why they needed two separate notes, but it may have been two teams that was working on it. So they wanted to have two notes, but anyway, that should again, make it go around static things like cars, parked cars, things like that. It should make it do a more effective job of getting around them and not unnaturally stopping and thinking about it for a while and then going around. Next up, we have improved longitudinal control smoothness for in-lane vehicles during high relative velocity scenarios by also considering relative acceleration in the trajectory optimization. I am really, really hoping that what this means is something like Chuck's left turn, the car will accelerate faster when it needs to. I, I may be reading between the lines a little bit here, but basically what it's talking about is either you're moving much faster than the car in front of you or the car behind you is moving much faster than you are. And it needs to either brake rapidly or juice it. <laughs> it needs to hit the accelerator so that it comes up to speed and it matches the speed of the other car behind you. So that would be the high relative velocity scenarios, right? You've either got the car behind you moving much more quickly than you, or you are moving much more quickly than the car in front of you. And in both of those situations, it needs to make a decision. It generally brakes reasonably well, although a little bit late in my mind, but the big problem is always the acceleration. So the car will pull out into a lane and then there's a car behind you and you know it's like it's coming up really fast behind you and you don't want to do that thing where the guy has to slam on his brakes behind you you want to accelerate rapidly to to get up to speed so that the car behind you doesn't close that distance too quickly so i believe that's what we're looking at here and if that is the case that's going to be a huge huge improvement and of course we'll have chuck will be able to tell us right away if he goes out and does his chuck's left and he sees the car just gun it you know <laughs> if it gets out there and it turns into the lane and there's a guy behind him going 50 miles an hour and it just goes vroom and goes really fast that will be very exciting that'll be a very exciting moment because that means that the car has learned how to drive better it's learned how to not cause the guy behind you to you know slam on the brakes so anyway we will see about that it could also just be talking about braking earlier so it can brake more smoothly than it does because it is a little violent with the braking maneuvers so in any case hopefully what we'll see is both of those where it will accelerate more rapidly to get up to speed when a car is going much faster than it behind it. And also if it's coming up on a car quickly from the rear, that it will start to slow down quicker so that it can slow down in a more smooth, gradual manner rather than having to slam on the brakes at the very end. All right, and finally, we're to the last one. Reduced best case object photon to control system latency by 26% through adaptive planner scheduling, restructuring of trajectory selection, and parallelizing perception compute. This allows us to make quicker decisions and improve reaction time. 
So we can start with the end of that one. Quicker decisions, improved reaction time, good things, right? That's the kind of thing where like if you're a good driver and you're really concentrating on the road versus being not that good of a driver and being, you know, preoccupied with other things, yelling at the kids or looking in the mirror or whatever that kind of thing is. You want that faster reaction time because then you can drive the car better and you don't have to do violent maneuvers at the last second. So how is this being done? So the photon to control thing is basically from photons hitting the cameras to a decision being made about turning or accelerating or braking or something like that. So it's the whole process. How long does each tick of the clock take, right? So let's say it's 100 milliseconds to do that. That means it can do it 10 times a second. But if you can reduce that latency by 26%, you can make more times per second that it's actually going through that cycle and it's making decisions quicker. I believe it's been around 36 hertz so 36 times a second, it's making a decision. And a 26% improvement is nothing to sneeze at. That means it can be well over 40. It could be like 45-ish or something like that hurts. So it can be making decisions much more rapidly. Now, how is it doing that? Of course, this is a best case object to photon control system thing. So what they're doing is using adaptive planner scheduling, which basically means under circumstances where there's not a ridiculous amount of stuff happening, it's probably able to schedule things out and plan it more efficiently than before. So again, there may be situations where things are just completely chaotic and there's a lot of stuff going on. And in that case, the latency is going to go up. But what they're saying is that in a lot of cases, best cases, they can actually reduce that latency. And that's actually really, really good because if the car's driving in a relatively easy circumstance and it's not having to deal with complete chaos, that means it can make decisions more quickly. Like if a deer jumps out in the road while you're driving down the road, it's able to process that more quickly and make a decision about what to do more quickly. It isn't going to help, it sounds like, in very, very chaotic situations, like very chaotic intersections or something. But in that case, generally speaking, you're driving more slowly, so there's more time to deal with that. So the latency, you know, it's it's a balancing act. The latency won't be as important because you're not going as fast. Whereas if you're on a highway or a back road and going really quickly, but there's not as much stuff going on, the latency should be reduced by up to 20 which means that the reaction time of the car will be significantly faster. And again, it's adaptive planner scheduling, so they're not just using one fixed thing, but they're adapting it to the circumstances. They've restructured the trajectory selection. So again, I think that has to do with the potential trajectories that it's thinking about. And so they've restructured that probably for simpler situations. They don't have it do quite as much of a Monte Carlo thing where it searches a ton of different possibilities. It just goes like, this is close enough, this will work, you know, that kind of thing. So that can improve it a lot. And then also parallelizing perception compute means that they're not following one linear chain of compute. They've actually split it out and they're doing a bunch of parallel things at once and then putting it back together in the end. So all of that means in the best case, you reduce latency by 26%, which again is a huge, huge deal. All right, that was a ton to go through. I hope you stuck with me to the end. And I also hope you're really excited to try out 10.69.3 because again, these kind of improvements, they're starting to make improvements that are much more for the comfort of the driver and also for the comfort of people around you and making better decisions on a kind of minute level as opposed to very, very large things that are going on. Although there are some huge improvements like 51% and stuff like that. But anyway, they're really starting to look at fine tuning things and making this all much, much better better. I'm actually super interested to see how the control for more precise object geometry detection is done. I think that actually is going to be very interesting. I don't know that we'll be able to tell directly, but I'm hoping that what we'll see is that we'll see a much longer distance that is able to see out when it's going quickly for the occupancy network. So it'll be able to make decisions more effectively when things are far away when you're going at high speeds. And then when you're going at slow speeds, hopefully it will be more accurate about where things are. But we might need to drive cars without ultrasonic sensors to really get a sense for that. Anyway, there's a ton of improvements here. I can't wait to drive FSD 10.69.3. And in the meantime, let me know what you think about these. And if I missed anything, or if you have a different idea about the two-stage network architecture, that would be interesting to know. Because again, I'm just speculating about that. And of course, if you enjoyed this episode, please do like it so other people can find it and consider subscribing for more of this kind of content. And thank you, of course, to my patrons on Patreon. I really do appreciate everything that you do for me. It really does make life a lot easier. I very much appreciate it. And of course, if you want to join the team, just check out the link in the description. Meantime, I'll see you all in the next one. Bye-bye.